they do. Yeah. And he knows that. But I think that he's looking for something that's going to kind of, like, yeah, yeah, I think that's making it across the side. Yeah, like, I think that would be expected. Yeah, <laughs> 
so I can actually use a small See, I can't plug it in, so a small HDMI Yeah, we gotta get one right now So, I guess you're gonna have to work it out when you get up here Yeah, that's probably not So, yeah, it's gonna be tough Find right here Or the new battery Hello everyone, if you could take your seats, we're just about ready to start. So this will be uh, Social Machines 9. We're in here for an hour and a half. We've got three lovely speakers lined up for you. Uh, the first of whom will be Aaron talking about Wikicredit. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I have a lot to talk to you guys about. I'm going to talk really fast, but don't worry. I, I will sum it up when I get to the end. Um, so with no further ado, here we go. So uh, who the heck am I? So, I'm a researcher, I work for the Wikimedia Foundation, I study social technologies, this is my, my uh, Wikimedia Foundation user page, I'm also a volunteer, and I work on Wikipedia, I, I don't edit that many articles, but I build a lot of tools for Wikipedia editors, and so today, what I want to talk to you about is a sort of tool that's, that's not just for individual editors, but for the whole collection of uh, Wikipedia workers. So, I do a lot of work in, in science, uh, my, the, the things that I like to do is build new theory about how people work online, how we might better s support that, and then turn that into technologies. And then the Wikipedia inside of my work is to take those technologies and put them into Wikipedia and try to see if they work and if we can actually make things better with them. So today, what I'm going to talk to you about is measuring the value of work in Wikipedia. What that means, why we might do it, and then how we might actually get it done. Uh, I, I also want to talk about the implications of measuring value because there's a lot of them. This is sort of like grabbing the third rail, and I think that when we do so, we should be both bold and considerate of the problems that we might cause. And I'll give you a little bit of uh, uh, information about the development status of the system that I'm going to be talking about. So, part one, the what, why, and how. So, uh, before I get started talking to you about what this is, I, I need to tell you a story that's how I got started on this project. So this is, the, this is the personal page of a researcher at the University of Minnesota, uh, Christopher Waite. He's a urologic surgeon, he has students, he teaches classes, he does research. Um, and so I, I got to, talk to talking to him about Wikipedia things. And so this, was a, this conversation happened like three years ago, so I'm just paraphrasing now, but I want to give you an insight into what we were talking about. I asked him, what would make you edit Wikipedia more? And he told me that if I could say with confidence, that I added some amount of value to Wikipedia, that would be inspiring. I, I could use that, I can use that to do things. And if my students can put, put that on their resume and prove it, prove that they added value to Wikipedia, that would help them get a job or tenure. And so I got to thinking about merit and subject matter experts. Subject matter experts like academic professors or even professionals in, in all sorts of fields. Um, so we live in something that we like to refer to as a meritocracy. That, you know, in, in theory, the way that this works is that you have an, a positive impact and that gets you good jobs, money, power, you know, invitations to come speak, that sort of stuff. That it's not on who you are so much as what you've done. Um, in practice, the way that this works is really if, if you do something that can be counted, that counts. But if it can't be counted, then it doesn't count. It doesn't actually count towards your merit. It doesn't get you those jobs, that money, that power. Um, and so for subject matter experts, uh, merit comes in the form, countable merit comes in the form of academic degrees, awards that you've received, invited talks that you've given, and really the big thing is published papers and books. Um, and all of that is blown out of the water by these important metrics that are based on citations in this measure that we've been using for forever called an H-index. Now, so this is, this is the essence of my profile page for being an academic. This is my Google Scholar profile. It shows the, the papers that I've written and notice that it shows how often they've been cited. You can see my H index there. You can see how this has been going over time. This is, 
essentially what gets you clout in academia. This helps you get jobs for people who can't read through all of your work, uh, understand the fields in which you're publishing, and learn the nuance, because that would take too long. It's so much easier if we can just have a good metric for it and use numbers as sort of like a filtering criteria. Um, you know, like I was saying, but academic merit is more nuanced than that. Well, it's, it's too bad. We, we can't sort on that stuff. We couldn't possibly understand all the merit, and so we're stuck with metrics. This is just something that we have to use. And so there's a big movement in academia right now to expand our set of metrics to things that are more relevant for the internet age. Um, they're generally referred to the alt metrics movement. And so, so they're using uh, signals that are on the internet about what research is actually having impact, like comments, links, and rehostings of research papers to get a sense for what work is important, what researchers have merit, what researchers are having impact. So now I want to ask the question, what if we could accurately measure value added to Wikipedia and allow editors to claim it? Well, here's how I imagine that might look like. Um, this, is, this is a mock graph. I didn't actually generate this from a, a user. There's Actually, I never checked. I don't know if there is a user called value adder on any of our wikis, but there might be. Um, but anyway, so I want to talk about this graph so that we're all on the same page of what we're sort of thinking about here. So I have these bars on the bottom of the graph, which I, I intend to represent as the amount of value that this user added to Wikipedia on a monthly basis. And then there's this line that goes across the top, this big area, which would be the total amount of value that this editor added. And so this, this kind of gives you a sense for what this might look like over time, how we might present it. I want to take something like this, something that we, we might generate, and wrap it into a, a web interface. Uh, something that, so this is sort of just like a mock-up of a two-page interface, where on the left-hand side we have the screen that has the privacy policy, lets you know what I'm doing, why, where I get this data, that sort of stuff, lets you log in with your Wikipedia account, and on the right you can see a profile page that's very similar to the one that I just showed you in Google Scholar for myself. Uh, that would include the value added and some other metrics about what this user is doing uh, in their Wikipedia work. And so now I want to move on to how might we actually measure that? Where do those bars and stuff come from? So there, there's a lot of work in this area. I'm just going to highlight one real quick because I think it's going to help us think about this. So it's this work that was published in 2007 by Rhea Petorsky and a bunch of other um, uh, researchers at the Group Lens Research Lab at the University of Minnesota. They came up with this metric for value added in Wikipedia that they called persistent word root, uh, sorry, persistent word views. And so the inside of this is that if you look at how content persists in Wikipedia, you can get a sense for who added what content at any point in time. And so I have this example here with five revisions and these arrows connecting the words that persist between those revisions. And notice that the words that don't persist don't have arrows connecting them. Um, and so this shows you both how much content somebody is adding, which is sort of a measure of their, their input into the system, and it also gives you a sense for value, or sorry, the quality of the work that they're, they're adding to Wikipedia. And so you can see in this second revision, my little mocked up here, that, that apples are blue. That word blue wasn't a very valuable addition, so it tends to not persist. But apples are red was a valuable addition, so that persists, and it gets reverted back into the article. This is actually a common pattern that we tend to see in Wikipedia. Um, usually not with colors, though. Usually with, you know, vandalism. So, and the other side of this metric was multiplying the persistence of content in pages by the number of times that the pages were viewed. And so really what we're talking about here is, on the left we have a measure of productivity, which is the amount of content contributed times the quality of that content that makes it persist. Um, by the importance of that, with the insight that content that's viewed a lot in Wikipedia is important to readers. Readers are getting a lot of value out of that, so if you add content to articles that are viewed, then that's a valuable contribution. So this isn't perfect, by a long shot. Um, it doesn't measure top page activity, which is really important. Wikipedia wouldn't work without that sort of coordination. It doesn't measure template work, and Wikipedia is full of templates, and they do useful things. It doesn't even touch on image uploads, which of course is a critical part of Wikipedia. And it doesn't count counter-vandalism work. It just sort of relies on counter-vandalism work to happen. But it's good, because this metric rewards adding good new content to highly viewed articles. So now part two. I want to talk about the implications of using a measure like this in Wikipedia to measure and present value. So I want to talk for a bit about encyclopedic importance. So uh, when I was doing some background work on this, I was looking at uh, what were the most viewed articles in Wikipedia? What sort of things would this, this algorithm, this measure, pick out as the most important things? So I, I grabbed some data from this Wikitrends Tool Labs tool. 
um, from 2013, and one of the most top viewed articles in 2013 was Breaking Bad. Uh, who here has heard of Breaking Bad? So basically everybody in the room. Um, so so this, this has some importance. People know about it. Obviously it was viewed a ton, about 17.1 million times in 2013. Um, but way further down on the list is Japan. Who's heard of Japan? So, so everybody again. Um, but it was only viewed 6.6 .6 million times. And so now I want to ask, is Breaking Bad really three times more important than Japan? Uh, way more, right? And so, uh, even further, so if you, if you haven't seen Breaking Bad, I'm guessing everybody has because everybody raised their hand, it's a popular show. So it's about, like, uh, chemistry is like a main theme in this show. And it turns out that chemistry is viewed ten times less times than Breaking Bad. So is Breaking Bad ten times more important than chemistry? I mean, it sounds kind of absurd, right? So alternative measures are needed. This, this may be a useful thing, it's, it's giving value to readers, but we need to understand importance better. We can't just, we can't just pick one and rely on it. We, we should be exploring a few and figuring out what type of importance it's actually measuring. Um, and I need your help, because I want to get this to work. I want it to be good, but I can't make it perfect. I really need somebody that will dig into this stuff with me, and I already have people who are working with me to help this out. I would love if you would be interested in this. Next, social motivation. This, this is a big part of my line of work. I want to understand what motivates people to edit Wikipedia. I want to build tools that help them do what they're motivated to do. Um, so there's, there's like three uh, general themes that I want to talk to you about and how people are motivated and how this might affect it. So the first one is group motivation. So for this, I want to talk about the tragedy of the commons. Um, so it's this idea that when there's this sort of group resource um, and a bunch of people are working on it, it's really easy to say, man, that looks hard. If I don't do it, these other people will, and I'll just be able to benefit from, from that resource. And so it's, it's kind of uh, a, an open question still in the field. What, what pushes somebody to instead say, oh, wow, cool, how can I help? And actually engage in this sort of stuff. We actually run, well, researchers try to run surveys on Wikipedians constantly to dig into what their motivation structure is. Um, so the state of the art right now is this kind of ugly looking model, it, it's called the collective effort model, and what it's trying to do is, is draw this intersection between understandings of what motivates people about participating in a group and participating as an individual, and I don't want you, I don't want to dig into all the stuff that's in here, but what I want to highlight is that one of the, the, there's two terms in here that I think are really interesting. One is individual performance. What is the individual doing for, the, uh, for themselves? And the other one is the contribution to group performance, um, which is how much this individual is contributing to the group benefit. And so I, I think a critical thing that something like measuring value and presenting it uh, might have is short-circuiting this and pushing the notion that this individual produced this much value for the group outcome and helping push this motivational curve to boost individual motivation, therefore boost individual effort for the work that people actually do inside of the wiki. Cool, right? Well, so the next group motivation uh, uh, theme I want to talk about is the undermining effect. So this is, this is a commonly uh, uh, understood effect that we've, we've demonstrated empirically in social science. Um, where if somebody actually crosses from this mad that looks hard to, to uh, contributing to Wikipedia, that there's something in their personal motivation, something that we don't quite understand, but something in their per personal motivation that pushed them there. Um, well, if they're already there and volunteering their time, and then we, we pay them instead, we can push them towards contributing to Wikipedia or doing some other volunteer activity with money. And people like money, so they'll, they'll do that. But it sort of pushes this personal motivation to the side so that when we take the money away, it, it ends up destroying the personal motivation that was there in the first place. And so people will move away from the original volunteer activity that they engaged in. You know, and you can see this guy, that was hard. I, I don't know if I want to do that anymore. I lost the motivation to do it in the first place. So it's sort of an open question. Is, is merit-based recognition the same thing as money in this regard? That it, am I short-circuiting somebody's original purpose for editing Wikipedia by giving them some other reason why they might be doing it, I, I would really like to understand that, and I would like your help. This is something that I do, I do it a lot, I measure people's motivation as it plays out in their behavior, but I need help to understand this. I'm not a social psychologist, I'm a computer scientist, and I really like social psychi psychology. Okay, last theme for group motivation is rankings and competition. So. You can imagine a ranking, it might look something like this. There's, there's this group of people, the first person added that much of value to Wikipedia, the 14th person added less. Um, and so now I want to ask, so imagine that this is you in this ranked list, and for some people, 
this is motivating to see a ranked list, to see how they sort up, and, and to try and move higher in that ranked list. And so I want, I want you guys to raise your hand if you think that this would get you excited about editing Wikipedia. And so we have about half the room. Um, what about, for other people though, this would demotivate you and it's frustrating to be put in a ranked list and to, to be judged on the, the type of work that you're doing, especially by a metric that doesn't understand all of it. So how many of you do you think would be frustrated by being put in this list right now? And so uh, that's a little bit more than half the room. <laughs> and and so, so we have this gender gap. I don't need to tell you guys about it. We've been talking about it for years. Uh, but it turns out that there are fewer female editors than there are male editors. And, and if you look to the literature, this, this corresponds to all sorts of places that when we have competitive systems like this, it tends to motivate more males and it tends to demotivate females. So holy cow, what if we release this and we just make the gender gap worse? So what, what could we do? Um, so, Option number one, this is just one thing that you could try, is you can have the user control the visibility. Google Scholar actually does this. And so if you want to have a public score, cool. You can be in that ranked list, you can, you can publish your profile, you can brag about how much value you added, but if you don't want to have a public score, that's cool too. You can keep it hidden and it'll be hidden by default, so you actually need to get there and actually open it up to other people if you want them to see it. So, but, but what about getting credit? If you have your profile hidden, you might still want to be able to put it on your resume. Um, so there are options for that. We can give you an access token. And we, we can give you some ideas or some, some options on how you have that access token. So maybe, maybe we could give you a persistent URL. This is one of the ways that Google Docs will allow you to give people access to a document that you're working on. Or maybe we can put a time bound on it. So maybe that URL is only, only valid for a week. And so after that week, that URL won't work anymore and you can just generate a new one. Um, so what I want to say is that there's ways that we can sort of have our cake and eat it too, and there's definitely a lot of room for study here. Um, so the last thing that I want to talk to you guys about is gaming and deviant behavior, because I think this is a really critical thing when we're doing something like grabbing the third rail. Um, so there's an attack that I want to talk to you guys about, uh, which, which I, I would refer to as false, false authorship. Um, so, um, you know, this example that I showed you of content persisting through an article, the way that we can actually track content persisting article is through using difference algorithms. Um, and so here's an example of two lists of tokens that I might want to find the difference between to see how this set of tokens changed, or sorry, this sequence of tokens changed. The computer scientists are going to get mad at me. Anyway, so looking at these two lists of tokens, you can use your human intuition, and it's very straightforward. You can see that D corresponds to B, D corresponds to D, and the two A's and C's, they didn't move. Um, but if you use the most common difference algorithm, in fact, the one that's based into Wikipedia right now, it's based on this longest common substring strategy, and that longest common substring strategy will not figure out that those two Bs are the same. It's just not capable of understanding that type of content move. Um, so the, there's this question, how can we accurately attribute uh, authorship if we're using this type of difference algorithm? Well, it turns out that people have been researching this. And it's great because I get to just power their work. It's like importing libraries. It's wonderful. Um, so uh, Fabian Flock and Luca Dale Faro have been pushing on this, this problem of how do you accurately attribute content when people are moving content around in, in Wikipedia articles and that sort of stuff. And they've made some really good progress. Um, as far as I can tell, the state of the art is this sort of strategy that I've implemented in some code um, that I like to refer to as segment matching. So the segmentation process where you can divide a content in an article into paragraphs and sentences and other chunks of, of content, you can use hashing algorithm to, to identify those, those uh, chunks that are perfect matches and then remove those from the set and perform that longest common substring difference algorithm on the stuff that's left over. And it turns out that this works pretty good. This is one of the things that uh, Fabian Flock has demonstrated in his research. Um, so using this sort of strategy, we can make the difference algorithms, the segmentation matcher strategy, uh, more closely match intuition and prevent a lot of uh, gaming type strategies. Um, so, but this is just one type of attack. And this, this algorithm, I mean, if you know how it works, you might be intelligent enough to get around it. So how do we, what do we do about future attacks? Um, so I think that we can do a lot with system architecture and considering how we're going to make a contract with our users. So uh, this is some architecture. There's a lot of stuff in here. I really just want to show you that the information goes from the Wikipedia API in the upper right down around through to the Wikicredit system in the, the lower right. Um, and 
So in the, the upper right, there's this difference engine system. This performs the computationally complex part of the work and then stores the results. So if we don't need to update the difference algorithm, we can just keep reprocessing that, that already produced difference results and not have to do the computationally intensive part again. There's this part that's the persistence tracker, and so this what this is what attributes authorship. And so there's a lot of there's a little bit of computational difficulty here, but there's a lot of storage difficulty. And um, then on the, the lower right, I have this this presentation part of the system, and this would actually be the part that measures importance. And one of those options is page views. I'm actually looking into a few others. So imagine if we actually needed to change the way that we rated importance. We decided that importance was a problem. We wouldn't have to generate the diffs again. We wouldn't have to generate the authorship again. We could just change our importance metric and regenerate our statistics. And so if we find that there's an attack, um, further down the pipeline than actually generating difference, we can fix it really, really fast. And when it turns out that we need to do it by generating difference, well, that we would have needed to do that anyway if we didn't solve this problem with our system architecture. Um, so, and I think that we can embrace a contract that's uh, like Google versus search engine optimization. Um, who here has heard of search engine optimization? Okay, good, I don't wanna explain that. Um, so what you do is you identify gaming behavior. You see people actually causing problems in the system. Then you update the algorithm, and you use transparency to explain that you updated the algorithm, and here's why, and it's going to change the stats as they're generated, and so now this sort of gaming strategy doesn't work anymore. And I need your help for this, because I, I'm not gonna be able to identify all the gaming strategies that are going to be employed on the system. I'm not gonna be able to write all the code to handle all of these gaming strategies, though I'm certainly going to try. I can really use your help. Or, you can just use my work. If you don't want to use wiki credit, but you would like diffs, or you would like authorship information, so like Wikiblame is a really good example of something that might use authorship information. I, in that system diagram, I noted that I want to provide APIs and regular database dumps so you can process the dumps, you can query for data from the APIs. I want this information to be available for you. And I've been solving a ton of problems along the way in order to get the system up and running. And so I've been publishing libraries so that other people can take advantage of this. So general utilities, I have an article classifier, a system for connecting to Wikimedia through uh, OAuth, um, uh, the system for doing the intelligent uh, state-of-the-art difference detection, and a system for tracking changes in Wikipedia so that you can keep things like this up to date. Um, and so to, to recap real quick, if I lost you or I talked too fast or something like that, this is basically what I'm telling you, is metrics are a fact of life. You know, we're not gonna get away from them. We have to deal with them. It's a way that we do information filtering. Um, but we can do a good job of it in Wikipedia. You know, not a perfect job, but we can do a good job. And this is, this is how good metrics work, is that they do something good. We understand the caveats as best as we can. And we try and update it to make it better as we go. Um, I need your help in order to get the system up and running, in order to make sure that we improve upon it to use better measures of importance than the one that I'm hoping to start with right away. But if you don't want to help with this, I, I want to help you do similar stuff. I think there's a lot, of, a lot of really cool things that we can do if we track content better, if we, if we present information better to people, and I think we can do a lot of research with the outputs that are going to be part of this system. Thank you. Sorry, the number of what? Ah, uh, yes. So the, the number of inlinks is the, uh, we, we actually might switch to that strategy. That's shown some really cool promise. That's something that I, I, I didn't put in the presentation because I didn't think that I'd have time. But it turns out, so that relationship between chemistry and, and breaking bad, where, where breaking bad is 10 times more important than chemistry by page views, uh, flips the exact opposite way if you use inlinks, where chemistry is 10 times more important than breaking bad. So I think that that metric shows some real promise, and it's actually more, it, it's much easier to generate than the page view rate. It's, it's actually a really simple query to the MediaWiki database. You can actually get it from the API just fine, too. So there was one in the back there. Uh, would the references that you cite make any uh, sense in uh, rating the scores? 
the reference. I, I I absolutely think that that's a good idea. I think that I mean this 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 algorithmic approach to this. I mean we might con count contributions by the raw number of words that people put into an article, but but I mean what's a word in Wikipedia? There's templates, there's references, and not all words are as hard to add as others. And so I think that there's a lot of space to sort of dig into what sort of task types are people performing and which ones are harder than others. So I think references are an excellent example of one that might be easier to extract and really meaningful. And so that's something that I'd really like some help to dig into. You know, it, it's really interesting because I don't think that we can beat human intuition ever with an algorithm. Um, and so, so if the, the humans that are there to sort of evaluate the content that's been added disagree on whether it's important and valuable or not, um, then, then I don't think that we can beat that. I think we can get a lot of signals from human intuition and, it, and use that in the algorithm. But yeah, that's, that's a really hard one to beat. You know, I would really like it if there was a, a way that we could say, okay, somebody's been trying to add this content for a long time and failing, and then they had a discussion with people and improved the policies around what content exists there, and then it was added, that we wouldn't just give them credit for eventually adding the content, but we'd be able to somehow give them credit for updating the policies and making them better. Gosh, I have no idea how to measure that, but there's a lot of value there. Um, Miko. Yeah. And so on. So uh, maybe many metrics would be useful. I mean, I might make the argument that, in fact, if, if, if you're writing the Breaking Bad article and giving three times as many people answers to their questions than yeah. the chemistry article, then why shouldn't you be rewarded for that? But I can also see the other argument. So, so maybe we should be thinking about multiple metrics. Uh, yeah. I, I think that that's a really good idea. I, I actually have that, I'm not gonna scroll back through my slides, but in my mock-up I actually have on the top of that graph um, uh, four different buttons that you could click. One was uh, sessions, which is a completely different talk, but a way to measure the actual amount of hours spent adding content to Wikipedia. And so that that's like a cool insight into, into actual effort put into the system. I think that different measures of importance might be really interesting to break out, especially this divide between incoming links and views, because obviously, you know, who am I to say what importance is? Is. You know, as an academic, like chemistry is obviously more important. But if you ask the population, Breaking Bad is more important, as you said. I think that that's 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 the right way to go about this. To say that there is not just one measure, and you might optimize for one over the other. And the other thing is that there are, there are existing places within our community where we talk about what we feel value, valuable and evaluate each other in terms of that. So I mean, the midship is one space, and there's actually quite a lot of different metrics that we're already using in that space, and a lot of ones which are we're not doing a very good job of computing, but we are talking about. Mm -hmm. And so people will talk about certainly ad accounts and featured articles and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And maybe looking to those places where we're already evaluating each other would be a useful way to inform the, the design of systems that are trying to capture value. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So the, the point was made that we, we have a lot of ground truth. We have a lot of human evaluation of people, of content, of importance. Actually, on English Wikipedia, if you go to the top page of most articles, you're going to find a wiki project rating of importance of this topic. And so if we can correspond these more general metrics that we can apply to every article um, with the, the ground truth or, or gold standard for certain types of importance that we've actually had human intuition trained on, we can develop these metrics and make sure that they at least closely match this human intuition. I think that's that's a keen insight. Would there be a way to adapt this in such a way that we could track what are the most important discussions going on? The I, I, I think that's a really interesting idea and a critical thing to say, for example, something like Echo, the notification system in Wikipedia, to be able to call to people's attention. Hey, there's an important conversation that you didn't watch, but you probably want to get involved in, maybe like a conversation recommender system. I actually have no idea what that would look like. I would really love to talk about it. Um, so it's up there. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. Great. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, so, there. It seems to me that if you want to motivate people, maybe it might be more interesting to look at the relative measures of importance. Uh, when you're talking about the measure of importance, it's always um, uh, the, the, the importance relative to Wikipedia, relative to everyone else. But maybe it's more interesting for people to put in their resume. Really good 
I, I, I think that's a keen insight. In fact, when I was talking to um, uh, Chris Waits, the, the story that I was telling at the beginning, um, he actually made the point that he didn't want to just be able to show that he added a certain amount of value to Wikipedia, but that he added a certain amount of value to Wikipedia's articles about medicine. And yeah, I think that that's, that's absolutely right. We, we have some, some somewhat decent ways to break down the content in Wikipedia by the subject matter that it's relevant to. The category hierarchy you think would just work, but it's actually not a hierarchy. So it doesn't, it doesn't actually turn out working that well. In fact, wiki projects are a much better way to sort of get at these high level areas. And so you could say that you added a certain amount of value relative to other people and absolute to yourself to articles covered by wiki project medicine. And I, I think that that's a, a nice way to get at this sort of thing. So once the system is up and running, I really hope that, that the, the parts that we construct on the way to actually being able to present you know, value added overall would afford us the ability to actually break down pages by where the value was added. That's, that's how I'm designing it right now. So it would be um, not so terribly difficult to add this on the back end, or maybe even explore it in the meantime so that when we deploy the first version of the system, that will be ready. So it was right there. Yep. So that's a, that's a really good question. I think we have an ethical obligation uh, when deploying a system like this. I use the third rail um, analogy because I think it's very dangerous. We, we can kill things with this, kill motivation, and, and uh, make, the, make the experience of being a Wikipedian painful. And so we have an obligation to study those things. I'm not familiar with, I mean, there, there's some stuff that pushes on this, some generalizable work that, that helps me understand this, and I, I, was, I was trying to present some of that here. Um, but I don't think that we have a really keen understanding of it. And we, we need to. We, we need to measure this as, as it goes out. This is actually my job at the foundation, is to understand the impact of software changes. And so I fully intend to do this. So next to uh, the last question asker. Um, so I guess my point was, you also need to have simplicity and the concept of authority. Because it's one thing for you to generate, but it's another thing for the person who's going to assess you to, to make, first of all, make use of it, but then to make use of it being in fact, to a certain level, a metric just then loses its meaning because it just used without any, any real understanding of what underlies it. If someone's got 90% of the test, what does that mean? They mean they've learned a lot beforehand, or their methods are very good, or the test was too easy. Um, the temptation to put it into metrics, you eventually just lose the meaning. And so people use them. So I, I think you're absolutely right. There are a lot of metrics that are, are not sort of backed by an authority that are already used in a merit-based way. So GitHub is a really good example of this. The number of pull requests that you've made to other people's repositories that are merged is something that people put on their resume and use to get a job. You know, and so, so I, I think that you're right, that, that it's good to have authority behind this. It's good to have consensus that, that we generally agree that this is good and then put an authority behind it. I think that we need to experiment with it first and if it's good, then we'll embrace it. And, and it's around that time that we might you know, put, consider something like putting some version of a stamp of approval on it. Or maybe, maybe putting some page on Wikipedia that says, hey, you academics out there that are considering uh, somebody's wiki score, this is what we generally think of what wiki scores are. You know Lila's early and late adopters curve? We need early adopters, and when we have them, we'll, we'll get the masses, um, if, if it grows that way. Oh, I'm sorry, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be around after you.
Jerome talking about cooperation. Please excuse the, the funny colours, but hopefully this is readable enough. Okay, well, thank you everyone for, for being here um, and for this lovely opportunity to present some of my work uh, that's related to Wikipedia and pure production efforts um, in general. This uh, particular research project uh, deals with the pro-social um, underpinnings of Wikipedia contributors' willingness to contribute to Wikipedia and work on Wikipedia as a uh, global public good. Uh, as many of you know, there are many studies around, we already have dozens of studies around that try to get at Wikipedia's motivations, but this one is unlike all the others in the sense that it does not rely on survey questions to try to get at Wikipedia's motivation to contribute. Um, yeah, um, and I want to avoid survey questions. Survey questions are fine, but I want to avoid that for two main reasons. We know that there are some important self-reporting biases uh, in survey questions, and people might not even know, uh, have a clear idea of what motivates them. So in that sense, uh, survey questions are somewhat flawed. What, I, what I'd like to use instead is um, an experimental slash game theoretical approach to the problem of contributing to Wikipedia and the motivation to contribute to Wikipedia as a public good. In order to understand what that means, I really like you to think about the decision to contribute to Wikipedia as a public goods dilemma. So what is a public goods dilemma? Let me just take an example, a simple example from Wikipedia itself. Uh, imagine a contributor who is passionate about physiology. That contributor uh, a potential contributor, goes into the physiology page on Wikipedia and notices that there are some flaws that he could uh, enhance the article. Now he has a private decision to make. Um, does he want to take action and actually implement the modification? Well, that action has a cost and it has a benefit, right? As it turns out, quite often you can assume that the private cost of taking that action is higher than the private benefit. Why? Because the cost involves you formatting your information in a proper encyclopedic way, providing secondary reliable sources, maybe entering into arguments with our contributors about the content that you posted, and so on and so forth. What's the benefit to you, privately? Well, a meager, because you can assume that you already know that information, at least at an intuitive level, right? On the other hand, there are huge social benefits to you, as an individual, taking that action and correcting the page, because by incurring that cost, you benefit many, many people around you. So here is the public goods dilemma, here is the tension. If you were perfectly selfish and rational, you would never take such an action. But if everybody's like that, nobody ever contributes to Wikipedia and we fail to produce the public good. And so we end up in the worst social situation ever. This is the way I want to think about contributions to Wikipedia, and in this respect, I kind of like that quote by Kizor, who's a Wikipedia administrator, who tells us the problem with Wikipedia is that it only works in practice. In theory, it can never work. So, actually, social science theory and economic theory, I'm an economist myself, um, has put forward three classes of pro-social motivations, understand non-selfish motivations, over-regarding motivations, that could push people towards overcoming that public goods dilemma and still contribute, incur that cost of contributing uh, to achieve a socially efficient outcome. And all of those pro-social motivations involve you taking, in your own calculation of your welfare, the level of welfare of the other people around you in a certain way. And there are three, one of three ways in which uh, that can happen according to the theory. 
Historically speaking, the first kind of pro-social preference that has been put forward is based on altruistic preference. Uh, it is basically you uh, deriving some welfare or, or utility, as economists like to say, from increasing the welfare of other people around you. That's one way this could work. A second way this could work is uh, through a reciprocity motivation. It is by, uh, through the gift exchange relationship that arises when you decide to incur the cost and contribute to the public good and you see other people reciprocating on your contribution, you derive welfare from that. The third explanation that we have around is based on a social image motivation. That social image motivation basically tells you that you will be willing to incur that cost of contributing if by incurring that cost, you are actually able to signal something, some quality about yourself to the community of their peers. You're a good person, you're talented, you're smart, whatever. And you derive some utility, some welfare from that. All of those pro-social tendencies, motivations, can help uh, people overcome that public goods dilemma. And so what I want to do in this paper is, as I said, not rely on, on survey questions, but on experiments to try and research which of those motivations, if any, actually help uh, or incentivize contributors to, to contribute to Wikipedia. And I'm going to do that in an experimental way. We have experiments that have been used for a very long time in physical university lab where people have been trying to test those theories, trying to see whether they actually behave selfishly or deviate from that selfishness assumption and how do they deviate? We have experiments uh, to try and measure that. But what I want to do here is something different. I don't want to do it in the lab. What I did is actually elicit the social motivations of a representative sample of Wikipedia contributors with an online experiment, directly bringing the experiment to Wikipedia contributors where they work online, and then doing something different, a second step. Rather than stopping there, actually asking the question, do the behavior of those Wikipedians in those experiments predict what they actually do in the field, on Wikipedia? The number of contributions they make, how they collaborate, and so on and so forth, controlling for a whole bunch of factors, age, gender, demography, you name it. So the goal here is to try and develop a workable theory of peer production that would factor in non-standard motivations, that is non-selfish motivations. For economists, selfishness is a standard motivation, believe it or not. Um, and then use it to inform the design of online collaborative spaces and also foster the development of peer production also beyond Wikipedia itself. So let me tell you a little bit about those experiments that I, that I mentioned before. As I said, we have three main classes of preferences that can help us overcome public goods dilemmas in every context, but in Wikipedia in particular. For each of those preferences, I'm going to try and give you two alternative measures so that we can check the consistency of the results that we get. First, the reciprocity motivation. The first thing that I'm going to, that I'm going to run on Wikipedia is a very simple public goods game. Imagine the following situation. You are playing with three other people in a group. Each one of you is endowed with $10. You have a private decision to make. How much of those $10 do you want to keep for yourself? If you keep them for yourself, you earn them. And how much do you want to invest in a common project? Each dollar that you invest in a common project is going to yield a return of $0.4 to you. It's not efficient for you to do that. However, it also yields a return of $0.4 to all the other members of your group. So that by investing one in the common project, the group as a whole earns 1.6 that should be redistributed. So here you see how this is the experimental translation with real monetary costs and payoffs of the public goods dilemma that I was explaining before. What I'm going to allow you to do in this game, as a Wikipedian playing that game online with other people, and by the way, in all the games that I'm going to present to you, uh, those Wikipedians who play never played among themselves, but in one situation, they always played with other random internet users. So I'm really trying to get a very deep, decontextualized preferences that are most likely to carry over from context to context here. Um, well, I'm going to allow you to condition your contribution to that public good on the contribution of the other members of your group. I'm going to ask you, if the other members of your group on average contribute nothing, how much do you want to contribute? If they contribute one, two, three, up to ten, how much do you want to contribute? And I'm going to measure 
how well you respond to the average contribution of the other contributors. If the other contributors contribute a lot, are you willing to contribute too, or are you going to try and free ride on your contribution and collect the money? This is what I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to measure, and this is going to be my first measure of reciprocity motivation. A second one that's also very standard in experimental economics and also behavioral research more generally is based on the trust game. In that game, I'm going to divide the population of Wikipedia contributors who participate in the experiment in two roles. We're going to have trusters on the one hand and trustees on the other hand. Here, I'm mostly going to be interested in the behavior of trustees that are called participant Bs here. Both of them are endowed with $10. Uh, participant A has a private decision to make how much he wants to send, pass over to participant B, the trustee, um, taken from his endowment. Each dollar that the truster sends to the trustee is multiplied by three and then received by the trustee. I don't care about that guy's decision for now. I'm going to return to it. It's a measure of trust towards anonymous strangers. What I'm concerned about is the behavior of the trustee who then has a private choice to make. How much of the amount that he received he wants to return to the truster knowing that he has absolutely no obligation to do so. If that guy was perfectly selfish and rational, he would never return anything. If he does, you can interpret that as an impulse to respond in kind. It's a reciprocity-oriented behavior. So that's going to be my second measure. I'm going to take the proportion of what the, that trustee here receives that he sends back to the truster as a measure of his reciprocity motive. So far, so good for reciprocity, altruism, certainly the workhorse in experimental economics and behavioral research to study altruism is based on the very simple dictator game, so that's what I'm going to use, very simple scenario. Again, I'm going to divide people into roles, we're going to have dictators and receivers. The dictator this time is the only one to be endowed with $10, the receiver has nothing and has the choice to donate whatever amount he wants to that anonymous strangers with whom he will never interact again, never see again, he does not know who he is. You can notice that the, that guy here has absolutely no say in the interaction, so that you can only interpret the amount that uh, the dictator sends as um, altruism towards that anonymous stranger. And I'm going to take the proportion of his endowment that he transfers as a baseline measure of his altruism. However, because I also fear that some Wikipedia contributors might be incentivized to contribute to, to the public good, not out of a sense of general altruism that's directed towards the general public, but out of a sense of altruism that's directed towards their fellow in-group of Wikipedia contributors. In this particular case, I'm going to rerun that dictator game within the Wikipedians who are willing to participate, explicitly telling them, it's actually true, that th this time they will be paired with another wiki type of contributor, another Wikipedian, asking them the exact same question, how much you want to transfer to that guy? And that's going to be a measure of directed or in-group altruism. Controlling for everything else, does that predict the intensity of uh, people's contributions to Wikipedia? That's the question. Okay? So, so far, so good. We have two different measures for each uh, preference, reciprocity, altruism, then what about the social image motive? Well, the social image motivation is something that's really difficult to measure experimentally, even more so in a decontextualized fashion. So what we're going to do here is that we're going to rely on the wealth of observational data that's available for Wikipedia to try and construct some indicators of revealed preference at the individual level for social image within the Wikipedia community. Again, I'm going to do that in two types of ways. The first way is that I'm going to simply measure the size and bytes of those contributors' user page. And I'm going to divide the sample into those who have relatively big user pages, those who have relatively small user pages. The argument being that those who have relatively big user pages are more concerned about conveying uh, information about themselves to the Wikipedia community, more concerned about their social image. I'm going to call them social signatures. Now, that can have flaws, so I'm also going to rely on an alternative indicator, um, which I take from Mako Healing here and Aaron Show uh, there. Um, if you uh, love the indicator, go to them. If you don't like it, come to me. Um, among subjects who received barn stars, I suppose that I don't have to explain what those are. I have a very hard time explaining that to economists usually. I spend like 15 minutes explaining that. Um, I'm going to consider as social signatures 
those who decided to manually move at least one of their awards from their talk page, where they usually receive those, to their personal user page, so that it would be explicitly displayed for the community to see forever and not likely to disappear in the flow of conversations or be archived in, the talk, in, a, in an old conversation in the talk page or whatever. And briefly speaking, about 50% of contributors decide to advertise their barn stars on their talk page, and I'm going to treat those as social signatures. Again, a very simple indicator, but this one is going to constrain my sample to super users, in a sense, because those are the ones that receive barn stars, but still, it's going to be useful. Okay, so, so far, um, this is what we have. Two alternative measures for each class of social preference that can help us overcome that public goods dilemma that's at the very core of the decision to of many decisions to contribute to Wikipedia. I'm going to try and use those measures to predict what, what those Wikipedians actually do in the field. In everything that I'm going to show you now, and what I'm going to try and explain is the total number of edits that those uh, participants have made to the Wikipedia projects. There are many other ways to define the amount of content that people um, uh, typically post on Wikipedia. All of them are consistent. We can also think about measures of collaborativeness or cooperativeness. Um, this is a different story, but in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on that. We only recruit from registered Wikipedia users in order to be able to track their full contribution records, obviously. More precisely, what we want to do in this project, unlike other projects, is that we don't want to focus on the top few hundred contributors to Wikipedia. What we actually want to do is to get a representative sample of the population of Wikipedia contributors. In order to achieve that, we're going to recruit um, or sample of Wikipedians from the three following groups. New Wikipedia contributors, just registered an account, engaged contributors, and the Wikipedia admins, which we treat as separate because they self-selected into performing a policing role. They have some special policing rights. So we treat, we recruit those uh, separately. We recruit them with this central notice banner that some of you may have seen uh, after a consultation with the uh, community, notably on the admin notice board. We team up with the Wikimedia Foundation and code a banner that looks for the metrics of editors when they log in Wikipedia, and if they're eligible to participate in the study, the banner is displayed to them on top of the Wikipedia page until they disable it or click on it, in which case they are redirected to an experimental economics platform that I own, are able to perform all of the games in turn, have their real earnings calculated at the end according to their decisions and the one of the others in their groups, and are actually paid through an automated PayPal transfer with the option of donating the money to the Wikimedia Foundation or the International Committee of the Red Cross, if they like. Some people on Wikipedia don't like monetary payments and don't understand why. Um, so the banner recruited 850 subjects in eight hours, which is about two complete answers per minute. For a 25 minute experiment, I was myself astonished by the rate at which people participated in this experiment. Um, and so here are the results. Crash course in econometrics for those who don't know about it. If you focus on those two numbers in here, this is the reciprocity measure based on the public goods game. The first one, this is the one based on the trust game. And those numbers here tell you all else equal, age, gender, education level, salary level, whatever. What's the estimated impact of moving from no reciprocity here to full reciprocity here? So you compare two people, they're exactly the same. One is totally reciprocal, the other one is not. The more stars there are here, the more precisely estimated is the impact. If you have no stars, it means that the impact, you have, you have no confidence in it, basically. And what we see here is that moving from no reciprocity to reciprocity on average on the whole sample is estimated to increase the number of Wikipedia contributions by 40%. Now this average effect conceals some interesting underlying heterogeneity, what you actually see if you divide the sample according to the median number of contributions that the Wikipedians made to the project. Here it's 2,000 contributions in this sample. And we run the exact same estimation in both subgroups. What you see is that the coefficient rises by 50% and is highly statistically significant in the below median group, but not in the above median group. What that suggests is that that reciprocity preference is a strong motivational driver for you. It will drive you from being a non-contributor to being an engaged contributor. Once you're already an engaged contributor, it's very difficult to predict how far you're going to go with this preference. 
The story for altruism is much more simple. Basically, what you see, if you consider the whole sample, below median, above median group, nothing works. Altruism does not seem to drive Wikipedia contributions, at least by that measure. Moving to social image, here you can see, based on the indicator, based on the user pages in the whole sample of contributors, a very strong and significant impact on the number of Wikipedia contributions. Revealing a taste for social image within the community by having a very large user page is associated with a rise almost a double uh, in your number of contributions to Wikipedia. Again, if you consider the below median group, you exclude the super users, the coefficient rises, but this time, by both measures, the user pages or the brand stars related one, a social image concerns continue to drive participation of super contributors, not like reciprocity. Actually, if you dig in that story a little bit, what you see is that reciprocity and social preference uh, and, and reciprocity and social image are actually totally orthogonal in the sample. Those that are motivated by reciprocity are not motivated by social image, and the reverse holds. Okay? So that's the basic story that I had uh, for you. Another thing uh, that I wanted to touch upon uh, very quickly that's uh, uh, part of my research that I thought would be interesting to you guys is uh, going back to that trust measure that I talked about before. So remember, in the trust game, the first mover, the truster, has a had a decision to make how much of his $10 he wants to transfer to a trustee, knowing that that amount will be multiplied by three, uh, hoping that that trustee will return something to him. That's a measure, an experimental measure, of trust towards anonymous strangers, right? So what I wanted to see here is whether trust in anonymous strangers correlate with the activity patterns of the Wikipedia administrators, if I focus on that group. Do less trusting administrators have specific policing activity patterns? This is the question. The first thing I do is check whether there is any correlation between trust by that measure and the number of Wikipedia contributions that non-administrators do. As you can see, no stars, which basically means there is no effect. However, estimate the exact same thing on the subsample of Wikipedia administrators, and you have a very strong negative relationship between trust in anonymous strangers and the intensity of participation in Wikipedia of those administrators. The less trusting they are, the more they participate. <laughs> now, now, what does that mean to participate more? Trying to dig in that effect, I collect specifically the number of users that those guys blocked, the number of pages that they deleted, the number of pages that they protected. Each and every time, the less trusting they are, the more they block, the more they delete pages. Really? So you have that maps onto, you know, think about anonymous users. If you have low trust in anonymous strangers, you may have low trust in those, uh, those newbies, and you may want to uh, block them more often, for instance. I was actually very surprised that this would work so well, so I actually went back to those Wikipedia administrators six months after the experiment, asking them specifically, what's the fraction of your working time on Wikipedia that you actually dedicate to policing activities on a zero to 10 point scale? I only have 27 administrators who answered that question, but with only 27 administrators, I'm still able to detect a very strong negative relationship between trust and the amount of their working time that they self-declare spending on policing activities on Wikipedia. Now, don't get me wrong. Here's the question for you. I have no idea whether this is a good or a bad thing. After all, the role of a sysadmin on a system is to keep the system secure, right? So maybe we need people who are dubious of others to protect the system. Maybe this is a good thing. Or maybe there is an optimal level of trust that those administrators should have. Maybe the, the, the ones that have very low level of trust overbite the newbies, in a sense, and create frustrations in the system. And I have absolutely no data to disentangle between those two options, but I think that this is a useful discussion for this audience and this community to have, and I would be interested to, to uh, know about what you think. Okay, let me uh, just conclude real fast. Reciprocity, what we learned is that reciprocity and social image, but not altruism, consistently appears underlying social motivations that predict the trajectory of a Wikipedia user from being a non-contributor to being an engaged contributor. In this process, what I told you is that reciprocity and social image seem to be substitutes rather than complementary motivational drivers. That is, that they are both at play, 
but in different subsets of the population of contributors. Finally, a taste for reciprocity does not continue to predict the trajectory of those Wikipedia users who become super contributors, while a taste for social image does. I also told you a little bit about Wikipedia and illustrators per se. I found that trust in anonymous strangers by this experimental measure is significantly negatively related to the extent of participation within that group. We could put forward an explanation based on the self-selection of those guys who went through a very costly peer review process to get those special oversight rights into holding the stick of the community in a sense. And again, I have no idea whether this is a good or bad news for the community. And what I find is that less trusting administrators are significantly more active, more likely to block other users from editing, more likely to delete Wikipedia pages, and self-declare dedicating a higher proportion of their working time on Wikipedia to policing activities. Thank you very much. So maybe let me just answer that first question. I have a very long introduction. I'm not sure how that precisely relates to prospect theory and economic theory in general, but the models are there in the background and we can talk about the technical details if you're interested. I'm, I'm not sure that that's of interest to everybody. Um, well, of course, uh, like uh, contributors, super contributors do not behave the same as uh, newbies who do not behave the same as slightly engaged contributors, which was why I rerun the estimations on uh, dividing the sample in two, right? Focusing on super contributors on the one hand and focusing on newbies to engage on the other hand, try to see if there are different determinants, and this is actually what I find. Um, so that's one way to see it. Okay, and the model? I think we're running out of time, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I would be happy to... I I'm, would be happy to talk more, but people tell me that we, we're really running out of time. We'd like to give other people a chance to. Uh, please. Um, yeah, you said that um, users who trusted other users less did more deleting, but uh, of pages and blocking. But was your study capable of distinguishing between that and the other way around? Namely, if I do a lot of blocking people, I start trusting other people less. So that's a very interesting question. Um, I have no idea whether the, the, the effect that I find here is a self-selection effect. Those guys are low trusting, and so they self-select into holding the stick. Or if it's a learning effect. By being a Wikipedia administrator, you're presumably exposed to many, many malicious users, and so you develop low trust. Could be both. I mean, sure, there is some self-selection here. I cannot say how much. I do. Um, unfortunately, the experiment was only done at one time, 
So if I cannot estimate the evolution in the social motivations and preferences of those guys, I cannot say anything about it, unfortunately. Uh, hit there on the back. Uh, can you detect the Dunning-Kruger effect in your experiments, uh, in, in the trust experiment? What I mean is, would smart people wrongly assume that everybody else is as smart as they are? As a result, get pushed around by editors or admins who actually uh, make worse contributions than them. I have nothing to say about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have no experiment to measure how smart people are. Uh, I, I should have asked about the SAT scores. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes. And second, related to the R squared values, which are, are quite low, should we read anything into those? So those those particular estimates. So this is uh, again a technical question. Those R squares do not have any meaning. Is the short answer, because this is not OLS. If you're familiar with that, it's a negative binomial. You can run it through OLS and log them and and but they have no meaning here. Actually, if you do it by OLS, you achieve twenty percent. Something like that, which is okay. One more question here. Uh, yeah, I am still in the process of rewriting the paper and adding many, many results. Uh, but if you want to email me, I can send you the latest version and keep you keep you you know up to date. Will it be open access? Of course. Who likes teletext? Yeah. And teletext class. Okay. Yeah, this is good. Jerome, now we have Max talking about measuring editor collaborativeness with economic modeling. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much. I think my talk is going to be slightly less economics focused, even though it has economics in the title, unlike Jerome's. But um, nonetheless, we can continue. Um, so first of all, I'll give it, let's have an audience poll. Um, how many people here are Wikipedia researchers? So quite a lot, maybe like half. And how many of you are familiar with network or graph theory? Okay, good. So that's as good. That, that makes me feel a lot better. And how many of you understand the page rank algorithm? Okay, so uh, a lot of my fears have been assuaged um, just in the last moment. So, um, great. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, one of the main problems that we have is uh, with new editors, they leave when they encounter uncooperative Wikipedians. Like this is kind of a, an old tale. So I want to, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about ways to, new ways to um, get, get, get around this problem. Um, and so I was thinking about suggestors and about how suggestors need input. Um, so, um, but when you have a new Wikipedian, they are, don't have any history. So I was trying to think about how you could make a suggestionless, um, uh, oh, sorry, an inputless suggestion device where you could just sort of say these are good places for you, even though you don't have any history, and we can't you know, so we can't recommend anything to you based on your history. 
Um, so I was trying to make something that new users could browse um, when you, as soon as they start, before they've even made their first edit, um, of like good places to start editing Wikipedia. Um, yeah, so basically, the, the way, and the way that I thought that would happen is we want to find the more functional parts of Wikipedia so that we can slot them in. I mean, you don't want to put, you know, give, they might want to edit something, but then it might be a page that is in the middle of an edit war, and that's like a terrible place for you to start making your first edit. So I wanted to find like the, like the smooth parts of Wikipedia where they could start um, getting their feet wet um, without too much pain. Um, so, they want to put them, make, put them in the most collaborative sort of parts of Wikipedia, but uh, what is collaboration on Wikipedia and how do you measure it? Um, and so, I was thinking about this a little bit, um, and I was thinking that um, basically you want to see about, you want to find the parts of Wikipedia where the, sorry, I bump up the, the font, um, where your experience as an editor can affect the article, article quality. So the better you are as an editor, the better the, the page becomes. Because um, that, and that would seem quite natural, like good editors make good pages. But in fact, that's not necessarily true, um, as I'll find. Like sometimes just editing makes a lot of rubbish on the page. And so you can like you can keep like bad things into a Wikipedia page rather than necessarily making more edits and making a page um, into a higher quality article. OK. Um, now I want to just file this, this thought away for later, is that it's not just about how your, um, there's, a, there's a reverse question of not just how an editor can affect article quality, but how the article quality affects your expertise um, as an editor. So like maybe you've edited good pages, does that necessarily, conf or pages that are high quality, does that mean you're necessarily uh, an expert editor? So just, this is a flip side of the question that I'm going to be answering, uh, so just keep this in your head um, and we'll talk about it later. Okay, so now to the economics part, I was um, reading these two papers, one is by Hidalgo Hausman, um, and the, uh, this basically um, is, is basically a, making a, a page rank algorithm on the um, global economy and sort of ranking, um, ranking countries this way. And then um, a second one is, um, and then, but he gets some of the math wrong, and then um, an Italian person fixes that properly in the subsequent paper. So you need to read both these together if you really want the full, um, if you want the full experience. Okay, so the principle of the the uh, the network problem is that um, we use a network science algorithm that, um, on the, this bipartite network to the rank the country's economic performance. Um, so that's quite simple. Basically, we're ranking performances. Um, and the key insight from this paper, all the things, did you have any favorite all the things memes? I couldn't find a very good one for this one, but this is all right. Um, yeah, so um, if you have a lower GDP, um, it's basically like you're basically maybe probably just an agricultural uh, sort of country, and you basically export ubiquitous products only. Um, but maybe you say you're like Switzerland, you basically ex you ex export like agriculture and maybe you also make watches. And so the, the key insight here is that, um, that the best economic performers don't export different products, but actually export all the products. Um, so you, yes, so the, the, that's the key insight is that um, the, super, the, like the, the most powerful countries um, just basically dominate in, and, and export all products. Um, so the way, then so what? Um, so the GDP rankings of the world economy can be known by just knowing which countries export which products. And one of the really incredible parts about this um, is that they didn't even have to consider the quantities of the exports. It's just simply knowing wh what the exports are. Um, so I found that really interesting that you can like, this is such, it's like such a simple calculation uh, that, that, can, uh, that can predict so much. Um, you, we're not even considering like how many, how much, how many bananas your banana republic is exporting. We just have to know that you're exporting only bananas, essentially. Okay, so I don't like the idea. I was trying to think about like um, the cow hamburger thing, but I'm a vegetarian, so I'm also going to talk about tofu. And, um, and unlike, I think that unlike laws and sausages, those who like wikis and tofu should really know how they're being made. So I'm going to show you how this sausage or how this tofu dish is made. Um, and this, this is where my name comes from. I'd like to delve into detail. So hopefully I'll just try and keep you entertained. Um, so a bipartite network 
is a network in which there are just basically two node types. So you're either blue or green, or in, in, in these two, in this set right here, um, and none of the nodes on one side connect to any of the nodes on the or connect inwardly. They only you only ever have links between the two groups and not within the group. Uh, so in this case, you can imagine the there being countries and there being products. Um, so on the left and the right, and so this is. And then we run the, the PageRank algorithm. So um, in the PageRank algorithm, like we'll, if we look at just the pointing hands, then you know basically the people that get most pointed to are the most important. Um, except now we're going to change that, and so you should imagine that there are like two node types. So so in this in this chart, there's only one node type. Um, there's no distinction. Um, and then later on, we're also the difference is that we're going to add an extra variable uh, for the importance of highly connected nodes. Um, and I'll explain that a bit more later. So, in lay terms, um, if you know who export what, then you can rank, rank the countries. And this is basically just like knowing all the players on a football field and like basically being able to predict the score if you knew like who passed to who in the game, then we would just be able to tell you the score. So, it's kind of incredible, and I really like this algorithm. Sorry? Germany wins in the end. That's, that's, that's my punchline, yeah. Um, so, the translation that I make out of this economics article is that instead of countries exporting products, that's sort of like editors writing articles. So, for the student in the audience, if instead of a rich country, what would we have, um, uh, what, what would be the Wikipedia equivalent to this? Just like super users, right? Like those power users in, in, a, in a category. Um, and instead of what would be a ubiquitous product in the. Yeah, exactly. So highly edited articles are the same sort of thing here. So the, the key insight translated would mean that the um, best, the, the, the super users don't just edit like one or like different types of articles, but edit lots of articles or most of the articles. Um, and I don't know if, like, obviously the best users don't edit all of Wikipedia, so instead of considering the global economy, I'm just going to consider one Wikipedia category at a time. Okay, so this is a new view that I've made of, uh, I think that, and I really enjoyed seeing this for the first time. Uh, this is what I call the editor article matrix. Um, and basically what you have here is, um, sorry I shouldn't straight from the mic. Okay, on the, um, Y-axis, you have um, articles. This, so this is the category of uh, feminist writers on English Wikipedia. And um, there's ed all the editors that have ever edited to that category are on the X-axis. Um, and all the um, articles that have ever existed in that, in that category are on the Y-axis. And if an editor has uh, touched the article, then there's, then there's a dot there. So, and then I've also uh, ordered this um, matrix on both on both axes, and what you can see is that, um, I'll show you with my cursor, that sort of along here, the best editors um, have edited like basically all of the, art the, all of the articles in this category, and the, um, the articles that have, are most popular are almost edited by everybody that has touched them, uh, more or less. So you get this, what's known as this triangular matrix, um, and so that kind of shows that the idea that we're working with from the economics holds. So one of the principles of the um, economics um, algorithm is that you have a triangular matrix to operate on. And indeed, it does look kind of triangular here. Um, plus, I actually think this is a really interesting way to view a category that hasn't really been seen before. So I like that. Um, I, th yeah. I think Aaron's what spooked you there. <laughs> OK. Um, so now I'm going to just go through the iterative algorithm. I'm going to ask you to imagine that you have a pound. It doesn't necessarily have to be floating in mercury, uh, like this one is. Um, so imagine that, you, that your everybody in the room is distributed with a pound. And then, uh, then you evenly distribute you, all your money to all the people that you have met before in the room. Okay, and you do that evenly. So you just like chop it up by the, the n number of people you know in the room. Um, so in, after one round and, during, and the start of round two, some people have, may have more or less than one pound. But again, with whatever money you've ended up with, you just redistribute that uh, to all your friends. Um, and then you just repeat, repeat that over and over again. Um, and then eventually that converges um, if you just keep on repeating this, this sort of algorithm. Um, 
And that's kind of like the page rank algorithm. Um, um, so now consider that happening over and over again, the iterative algorithm, but we're going to add one more variable. And except you don't d distribute your money evenly, uh, maybe you give your most popular friends, you know, some other people don't distribute their money evenly. Um, you can give your most popular friends a disproportionately large percentage. So if, if you're giving to somebody who has lots of friends, then maybe you don't give them just like, a, and then you only, see when you have two friends, you may not give them half of your money, but you may give them the more popular one, um, like three quarters of your money or something like that. So there's this, um, in network terms, you know that we can um, have a term, a variable here for preferential attachment. Um, and these are going to be the two the knobs that um, I use um, later on. Um, the, I call them alpha and beta. So uh, article popularity, the exponent that we give more importance to article popularity is alpha, and beta is the editor's portfolio size importance in the, um, in the algorithm. Okay, so it actually, this, this is a bit more understanding of it. This is how editors rise and fall over the iterations. So this is all of the users in uh, category feminist writers. Um, it has, uh, sorry, here this alpha is equal to zero and beta equals 0 0.72. I'll explain more of those numbers later. Um, but so at the, this, at, this is the very first, this on the most leftmost column, this is like um, everybody ordered by their number of pages they've touched in the category. Um, and then after this, the next bar is the first iteration. And that's um, like looking at, um, that, that's looking at the importance. So some users have uh, edited articles that have been edited more. And so in that case, they increase. And then if we run the algorithm converges over seven, uh, I think 64 iterations or something. Um, and you can see that some people who ha here haven't ar edited very many articles, but the articles that they have edited uh, were very popular. And so they sort of made this rise into the middle of the, uh, of the uh, ranking because um, they weren't ed editing very many articles, but they were very high quality articles that they were editing. Okay, so now I'm gonna, now the next part of the experiment requires some exogenous and miracle rankings from somewhere else, uh, from another part of the galaxy, um, of how to measure editors and articles. So, so basically my, the experiment relies on a comparison between two, um, between two measures. Um, so the way that we're gonna measure editors in another way is I'm gonna use Aaron, who was spoke here in the first talk, his, uh, and Stuart Geiger's uh, labor hours count, and this is, um, instead of, sorry? Is it wrong? Do you want to correct me? Oh, okay. You want, um, okay. So, <laughs> oh, wait, wait, sorry. Okay. <laughs> We're in London, okay. So, <laughs> Uh, I think yeah, it, how you, do, you do it differently in the paper. Anyway, so um, the lab, labor hours is the sum of all edit sessions. And what is an edit session? An edit session is uh, you just look at the start and end times of all the edits that occur with when, within one hour of each other. So you basically measure the amount of time somebody has been editing Wikipedia rather than the number of times they've edited Wikipedia. Um, so I'm gonna use this as the uh, other way that we rank editors. Um, and then the way that we're going to rank articles is um, the, the exogenous metric here is just this cocktail of text metrics that you just look at a page and you get the ratio of uh, markup to readable text, the number of headings, the article length, um, number of citations per article, and outgoing intra wiki links. And then I, this, uh, we look at the principal component of all of these and just get a magic number for the, um, the quality of an article. So, and now, okay, great, two minutes left. So, the, we're gonna do some calibration. Uh, again, the teletext sort of thing one. Um, and we're gonna try and maxim we're gonna try and find the alpha and beta, which maximize the correlation between our model and the exogenous rankings. Okay, so for instance, this is the category of feminist writers. This is uh, a chart, this is a graph of uh, alpha, is on the y-axis y and beta is on the x. And um, we find that uh, the uh, parameters here which maximize the correlation is about alpha equals zero along the line. 
um, and I'll explain the uh, interpretation of that. And then moving on to uh, the article correlation. Um, can you see? Can you see a contour here? I don't think it's coming through, is it? Okay, there's a contour line around here, which um, sadly is not. No, it doesn't make a difference. Okay. So one of the cool things about this is that we find really high correlations from about 0.6 to 0.9. Um, in the Spearman rank correlation. And it's better than the economics GDP papers, which only got around 0.4. So somehow, when this was, a, a, this was a really fun day for me, when I found out that the, when I copied this algorithm, it worked even better for Wikipedia than it does for like global economies. Um, so this actually was like really working. And to show you that it's also really working, I looked at it over time. So this is um, the category of feminist writers. Um, and this is the total number of edits occurring in that category from 2002 to 14, and then I took uh, snapshots at each of these red lines and ran the experiment at each of those points going back into the edit histories. And this is how the rank accuracy uh, increases over time. So this is like the maximum achievable uh, correlation that we can achieve between these two metrics, uh, between these two rankings. And you can see this is for articles, uh, and you can see like um, it occurs really quickly. Like so. It's like it doesn't work so well at first, but then it achieves like a quite like it sort of stabilizes and then it remains very high. Um, ranking editors takes a bit more time to get to get this right, but we still end up with very high correlations. Um, now I'm going to invite you to I'm running running this over 12 different categories, not just over feminist writers. Um, and now I've got uh, a game for you. So. I, I will explain later why I think that beta is a measure of the collaborativeness of it. But um, looking at these, I'm gonna well, put your hand up if you which one you think came out as the most collaborativeness. So number one, number two, okay, number three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, okay, eleven, and twelve. Okay, well, actually, it looks like the audience got that mostly right because, unsurprisingly, military history of the U.S. came out as the most collaborative <laughs> of it, um, and you, you think a lot of the audience got that right. Um, and um, now, the least collaborative. I'll just do this really quickly. So, be ready. Speed round. Uh, one, two, three, four. Five, yeah, five is big. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, yeah, eleven, and twelve. Okay, so it looks like nine was the, oh, sorry, uh, seven was the, five was the largest one here. And in fact, you were right again. Like, sexual acts is a really uncollaborative um, category. <laughs> but it's just like, it's just edit warring and people overwriting each other all the time. Um, so, yeah, so this is the full correlation. So, Remember, beta is like this measure of like how well the um, your um, a super user can perform in that. So like how well a super user is converting into article pop popularity. Uh, if you have a sorry, it's actually a, it's a negative exponent. So if you have a high beta, it means that super users are being really ineffectual. So in the military history of the U.S., like it's it's almost linear. Like if you're a super user, you like. Perf like the better you are as a super user, the more article quality you perform. But somehow, in, if you if this beta it feels above one, um, then it means like the more edits you make, the the worse the the, the, quality, the worse the article quality is performing. Um, and so yeah, like people are just like over. There's just like more and more edits are just making articles have lower and lower qualities, uh, lower and lower qualities in these categories. Um, um, and another really interesting thing that came out of this is, as I mentioned earlier, the input, uh, the editor article matrix just looks at touches rather than edit counts. Um, and I actually ran this both ways. And so this is for uh, the, uh, the correlation between um, for articles. And, and actually, you can see that we can find higher correlations between the two methods a little bit, but there's not really much in it if we use the edit count matrix. But here is the really cool part, uh, which is that for editors, um, the binary matrix, on, these are the different categories, by the way, sorry. Um, the edit count, the, the, the touch matrix is, uh, performs much better. So this kind of means that the, um, the amount of time... What's the difference between touch and edit? So edits, like, I just, if, 
if you make one or more edits to a page, you've touched it. And uh, you, then you only get a one there. So it's just like true or false whether or not you've touched it. Um, this means the amount of time you spend editing Wikipedia is more related to whether or not you've touched the page than how many times you've touched it. So that really just goes to show how bad edit count is of a measure of how bad, like we, why we shouldn't use edit count. Like time is just, it's, that, that's kind of completely insane to me that um, this should work better with a binary matrix, but it does. So that was a really cool result it felt. Okay, so let's zoom out of the forest and or the trees and see the forest. So I propose this beta as a measure of collaborativeness about how well super users can perform in a specific group. But now assume that we have this, how do we use it? Um, and um, I think one of the ways we can do that is to detect dysfunction um, in the categories. Um, so arguing is not necessarily bad, but like, it was at least really obvious in the case of sexual acts that we know that vandalism was occurring there and uh, maybe we could like intervene there. So we can sort of automatically detect a place where people, where more and more edits are not really, um, it's a really cute gif, isn't it? Um, <laughs> we, can re we can detect the places um, where, uh, where, ed where more and more editing is not in really improving article quality. Although uh, arguing is not necessarily bad, so people might be arguing, but they might be getting things right. Anyway, this is one way to detect that. Another way that we can do that is we can detect whether the wiki is working, where your time invested into an article is uh, related to the article quality positively. Imagine that. Um, and there are even cases, and that's when beta is negative, where it's super, line super linear, which means that, um, and it happened a little bit from military history of the US, where like every time somebody goes there, the article quality, every time somebody touches it, a new editor comes, the uh, article quality is like improving super linearly. And so, you know, if you have a mailing list and you have uh, tasks, then that may be occurring. Um, so we can also detect whether that wiki is working. And then in the last two minutes, I just want to uh, tell you about what I, how I feel that this could be potentially used. And I would really like to, I, the kind of the way I see it is that we could kind of make, when you come to edit Wikipedia, you could have like a carousel of like all the places where the wiki is working really well and all the really well organized places. And instead of like thinking about your interests first and then trying to edit Wikipedia in that way, you could see where all the like really prime areas of, for editing were and then see if you were interested in that. And uh, I actually kind of like that as a way, uh, this is up for discussion whether or not you think we should just present like soft areas of the wiki to new users. Um, but uh, that, that's how I think this could be used, is that we could give new users, like, um, just give them a, an opportunity to window shop for like, potential categories that they could really make a difference in, or where differences can be made well, if you, where your edits are like, really appreciated in that. So that's all I have to say, and I'll get us closer to lunch by taking a few questions then. Uh, yes, me Yeah, I think there have been some studies shown that like longer discussion pages are po co positively correlated to um, article quality, but it wasn't something that I used here. So maybe that would be another way to, one of the problems that I mentioned with like whether arguing was good or like, we could detect arguing or like, you know, a lot of reverts, um, but whether or not that's good or bad, um, maybe that would be a way to get to understand that better. Yes, Richie. No, actually, what I really, really like about this is that it's it's not that computationally intensive, especially if you use the if you use the the binary input matrix. Like, I don't even have to like pass the full version history. I just have to know who's touched what. Um, so I, I think it would it would be kind of I haven't I've thought about the uh, how I might run it over Wikipedia as a whole rather than twelve categories. Uh, but I think it could be done, and it wouldn't take you know like ten years to compute. We'll do it by data. Sorry. We'll do it by okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get it done. We'll start the cluster, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Aaron. So uh, you mentioned the possibility of, of introducing new users to spaces that are softer. Um, I, what do you think about the, the potential for running out of soft spaces? And you know, is this is this a good problem to have? Um, yeah, I don't know. That, that's something I've also been curious about. Like, I, if I could start running it over all categories, like how many of them would be soft? And the thing is, in, when a new user, if, if it is particularly a soft space because of either the topic or the people that get there, 
it it doesn't mean that an introduction would make it less soft. Like as long as it continues to be a very functional category where your touches on articles make improve them, then that still remains a soft category. So um, hopefully, introducing them would it, introducing it introducing a user to a soft category wouldn't uh, harden it in any way. But I guess that remains to be seen. So I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Did you account for the, the bots? Yes, I've removed bots from this. Yeah. In the back, yeah? Oh, sorry, this, uh, you first. Yes. Uh, how do you decide for the disagreement and uh, do you think it's themselves their type, number of articles that are categorized in each category? Um, yeah, I, so I select, try to select kind of a diverse range of categories. So this was the triangle slide again. Um, I think one of the largest ones, like I, actually that's why I ran over um, American male writers, American female writers, because there was like a, a controversy on there. And um, I didn't, I, I, there are some categories that only have like 100 articles in there. I think this one has, um, so there's like 1,200 editors here and 200 articles in this category. Um, so, uh, I, and then some of them, the bigger, um, the most intense, the intensive ones, I think 2013 films had like a thousand pages and like 10,000 editors or something like that. Um, so I don't, there is a diversity there, but I didn't do, I would need help to find an even larger diversity or do it over all of Wikipedia. Yeah, last question in the back. Have you looked at the, I mean, there was a mention there of new users and whether introducing people to have to affect the ranking one way or the other. Have you looked at whether the distribution of new, newer versus older users affects or is correlated in any way to what you're finding for, uh, for your, your results? Um, do you, so have I looked, the question is, have I looked at newer versus, like, do, are newer or older users particularly more I mean, is okay. the distribution of, like, this category has 20% old established users, this category has 80%, does that affect it in any way? Um, I haven't looked into, I didn't really look at this, um, account creation dates. Um, but that might be a nice a new way to go. So that, thank you, that would be interesting to for further research. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much to Aaron, Jerome, and Max for some fascinating sessions. Uh, we're now breaking for lunch. We'll be coming back at 2.30 for the final session of the day. Ha, ha, ha.